ay, ay, ay. Boy, that. You know how them talk show hosts must feel now with all them lights shining on them. Even a punk ass. No candle power light shining right at you. It's plenty distracting, people. But at least you know what to look at as far as facing your audience. You know where the camera is. Okay. Folks, please indulge me. Please forgive me. You're witnessing video history being made. Because this is the first even semi-high-tech image of me ever made, other than a few 35 millimeter camera shots, driver's license shot, a passport photo, things like that. There is no video record of my existence. Now I'm almost 66 years old, and uh, Been collecting old VHS camcorders at the junk store in Bad Axe for a couple of years now. My neighbor Dennis that drives me into town, he says, Al, what are you doing? Why are you buying all this junk? I said, well, I like to stay 30, 40 years behind the times, technologically speaking. At least as far as applied technology. As far as theoretical science goes, I like to be as close to cutting edge as I can. Unfortunately, I can't be all that close these days, but I still think about, still think about technology. Excuse me, still think about cutting edge physics, and I think about applied technology too. Let me see if I still hear it going. Yeah. I do, and uh, let me turn on my my camera still seems to be everything seems to be happening. Okay. focus is focusing on yours truly but no worry hope the microphone is picking up some audio because that's perhaps even more important where was I yeah my neighbor Dennis uh, oh, said Al why are you buying all this junk well last week I saw a four dollar old VHS camcorder and it had the battery pack and a battery with it. So I bought it. Sure enough, it fits on another old junk camcorder I bought that seemed to work but didn't have any battery or charger. So now I've cannibalized several items to put together what I believe, what I'm hoping, is a working VHS camcorder. Now I know in this day and age of DVD VHS videotapes are pretty well passe. Nonetheless, the sound ought to be at least acceptable. I'm using the uh, microphone that's uh, mounted right on the camera. It's not unmountable. So it's going to pick up a little motor noise from the, the uh, tape recorder being part of the camera. But it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, plus, I think it has a remote mic input. I think I can disable the on-camera microphone and uh, plug one in that I can hold right in front of me. But that's for, those are pipe dreams for the future. For the moment, am I centered? Is that thing aiming at me? Yes, it's the light that's off a bit. I'm in line with the camera. The light just isn't in line with me, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, and I found an old tripod that I was about to junk, but it only had two legs. But it all worked out, because where the third leg would have 
should have, normally would have gone, should have, would have, could have, uh, wasn't room. And my kitchen table was just the right height for the missing leg. And uh, how shall I put it? If the leg hadn't been missing, I probably would have had to remove it just to make the camera fit in the room here and have something to... It does seem to be a little... See if that levels things up a bit. Yeah, seems to. Let me see if we're still. Yeah. Yeah, boy, I hope it's, uh, I hope it's going, but if not, I'll try again with something else. But, as it says, it's history being made. A lot of people have said, Al, you should write a book. So I wrote one. Got about 6,000 pages down. However, I'm more of a talker than a writer. Well, perhaps I've learned to write a bit. Picked up a few tricks of the trade. Maybe not. At any rate, I got a lot of print on paper. A lot of words, a lot of ideas, a lot of pretty horrific reality. Reality that's been my life. Indeed it has. And as you can probably gather, I am not used to making movies and probably lack about all of the finesse that even an amateur might hope to have. But then finesse isn't my middle name. And it took me a few pages to get the hang of being a great writer too. Well, a few thousand pages. But uh, I suppose it'll take a few moments of uh, videating to master the tricks of that trade. In a way it's a lot easier than typing. Typing you gotta think about how to spell things and well endless stuff. Here you just look at the light. Go toward the light out. Look at the light and open your mouth and start blabbing. Blabbing about what Al? All oh, about my life. Same stuff that's in my book. It's autobiographical. The last couple thousand pages have been almost diary format because <clears throat> I've harkened back to the past so totally and so frequently that oh, overwhelmed me to the point where now it's almost diary like. I just write down what's happened most recently. But then interesting things still happened to me most recently, for instance. Yeah. Got a real interesting visit from the FBI, weapons of mass destruction coordinator, bomb technician, and his partner come to my house just a matter of days ago. Well, it's been a couple weeks now. Talked to him all afternoon, had the most interesting chat about assassinations and MKUltra, the CIA mind control program, and me and my MKUltraized friends. And me and myself and my own MK Ultra experiences. And yeah, I've had a few of them too. My neighbor Paul asked me the other day, he said, Al, have you ever seen uh, Conspiracy Theory, the movie with Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts? And I said, seen it, it's about me, huh? Well, it is, yeah. The, the character that Mel Gibson plays that's me. No, the movie producers took certain artistic liberties and uh, it's not 100% my life, but the essential ideas 
the, the basic story is, is me. I'm someone that resisted the best efforts of MK Ultra to make me into a mind control hypnotic zombie political assassin or something like that. That is assuming they have indeed failed to make me such a thing. I think they have had an effect on me. I don't think their efforts were entirely without without effect. No, no. They definitely, definitely have had an effect on me. For sure. But I don't think they uh, got the sort of control over me that they'd hoped for. On the other hand, they might have just been experimenting with me, along with many others, to see just who could be zombieized and who couldn't. Perhaps from their point of view, I'm not a failure at all, just another data point in their inquiry. They perhaps may have been well aware that not everyone can be MK ultraized. Or maybe they MK ultraed me to the max and I just don't know it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. But we're sort of getting ahead of the story. Yeah, that's me getting ahead of the story. Having a difficult time right now assembling my thoughts uh, because I'm so, my mind is sort of preoccupied with thinking about this new technological undertaking of mine, making a little video of myself. I mean, when you have to repair the cameras and fix everything, uh, borrow this and modify that and hope that it'll all work out. And, and I've been uh, sneaking up on this real gently uh, for the last 50 years or so, I suppose. This is the first actual camera I've aimed at myself. And, I repaired video tape recorders for years and years. Uh, I've worked at a lot of broadcasting stations and know a lot about cameras and videotape and lighting and recording and I'm sort of an electro techno geek. Actually I'm a big time techno geek. So I know about this stuff and Spent my life repairing it and calibrating it and building it and installing it. And, you know, I've been around video cams and VCRs all my life. Out in my garage, I got antiques that use two inch low band, that's two inch wide tape, folks. 14 inch reels, each reel weighed about 85 pounds. 14 inches around, two inches wide. Would record half an hour of black and white, low quality videotape from the 50s. I keep them just to remind myself of certain things. What I'm using right now is a portable battery powered VHS camcorder. It's got a 24 to 1 optical zoom, auto focusing, uh, built in mic, built in light, and uh, it's about what? 80. It's about 30 years old right now, maybe 35, so it's not quite back to the 2-inch tape <laughs> monster from the 50s, but it's a long way from the handheld, uh, uh, you know, chip, chip stored video devices of today, which I have one. I, I recently bought for 159 clams a little uh, teeny, weighs a couple, three ounces. Well, probably weighs four or five ounces, but it uh, it actually uh, records on its own chip uh, 1080 1080p high definition video. That's 1080 progressive scan high def video, and it's brand new and got its own charger and battery and all that. Even bought a an eight meg uh, eight uh, gigabyte chip which I could plug in. I could take this camera off the tripod right now and mount that high def gizmo on there and uh, be recording this in 1080p high def. 
but that would be way too big a, that would be way too big a step for me to take all at once. Uh, you know, I don't want to go from 35 millimeter stills to high def video without stopping in at the VHS videotape format at least for a, an hour or so. Sort of just so I don't get lightheaded and start swooning from the rapidity of my technological evolution. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get that two inch uh, 1950 1955 videotape machine out. It weighs about a million pounds and takes three men to move it. Actually, it takes four or five men and a dolly. So, and it wouldn't work nearly as good as this. This is, uh, this will be fine. And the sound is, is real important. Uh, at various times in my life, I've tried to uh, make uh, audio tapes of myself just on a little handheld uh, audio cassette recorder and a few reel-to-reel -reel attempts but they got lost or stolen or erased or who knows what I couldn't locate any of them if I tried well I've never tried but if I did try I don't think I'd have much luck uh, or perhaps I should say it would be just luck dumb luck if I ever found anything and, was able to retrieve any actual audio from years gone by. Sort of the story of my life. Uh, done a lot of interesting things, met a lot of interesting places, met a lot of interesting people. And uh, been in a lot of situations that would have well been worth recording, oh boy. But I'll try to explain it. Uh, the reason I was in those situations, and so many of them happened to me, is precisely because I was ready to be there and be involved in something other than running a tape recording or a video recording of myself. That is, a lot of situations require you to sort of throw down whatever you're doing and get involved in something somebody else is doing. And almost invariably that means you won't be able to take your microphones and your cameras and all that with you while you're involving yourself in somebody else's trip. It doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, you want to make a video, you got to be looking through the camera and holding the mic and operating the buttons and so on and so forth. And if you're trying to assist somebody else doing something real in their life, often you need both hands, both eyes, your mind, your, your everything to do that. So it was my willingness to jump in with both feet into other people's lives and get involved in what they were doing that precluded me from making any recordings of, of my helping these other people do their thing. I don't know how clear all that was, but it's an attempt to explain something that's real important in my life, actually, because uh, there's very little uh, evidence concrete of the many interesting things I've been involved with. All I can do is now, at almost age 66, tell you about them, write them down, speak them out loud in front of a camcorder, and that'll have to do it, folks, because there isn't any uh, recordings made of these events. That's not to say other people don't know about them. I'm sure the intelligence community, uh, in fact, they may have some recordings. Who knows? They love, they love to make recordings of everything. They may have recordings of me doing things with interesting people, but they don't tell me about it. They don't share them with me, so my version will have to be from memory. However, I have a pretty good memory, and while I'm probably as inclined as the next person to embellish, uh, I won't be doing much of that, if any, because because I don't need to. There's no, there, there is no reason to. The, the events I'm going to relate uh, are heavy enough in their own right that any, any effort to embellish them would almost render them 
ridiculous. Uh, they'd go beyond belief at that point. Uh, they're barely believable without any embellishment. Yeah. How many of you have faced a lynch mob? A lynch mob in earnest, throwing ropes over light lamp posts and trying to violently drag you away from the hands of the FBI and the CIA and the Secret Service and the state police and county sheriffs and the city police and several hundred other law enforcement personnel who are trying to arrest us for assassinating George Wallace, the presidential candidate, years and years ago, decades ago. And they wanted to arrest us and, you know, get points with their superiors for nabbing the assassins and to have us hung on the spot by extreme right-wing zealots uh, wouldn't have made them look any better. I know they're supposed to bring us in for justice. So I didn't get lynched, but, you know, I saw ropes being thrown over tree limbs and lamp poles and lots of ropes and tens of thousands of irate right-wingers that were slugging it out with the cops uh, to try to get to my two friends and I and lynch us for assassinating George Wallace. Of course, he didn't get assassinated right then. Uh, I didn't get him until uh, a few weeks later. But that was just because something went wrong and the real shooter couldn't get a good shot in. And apparently it was a last minute goof up and they were so sure that they were going to be able to take him out on the evening we were arrested, so sure they could nail it on us. My two friends and I must have been on the Oswald list as it's came to be known as, as it's come to be known as. Back then, it was too close to the Kennedy assassination. I'm not sure if they'd called it the, if it had picked up that name yet, but so uh, that's what it's known as now. And that's a list of people that when the powers that be have to assassinate someone, you know, somebody, a noteworthy public figure, let's say, they already have a list of people that it will be real easy to frame up to patsy eyes because they've made, you know, speeches threatening radical behavior or they've passed out leaflets or they've been involved in various activities in their life that would make the public believe, yes, it's just the sort of person that would shoot the president or the governor or whoever. So they keep a list of such people and then when they when the powers that be want to assassinate someone they have a professional do the actual shooting and then uh, nail it on somebody on the Oswald list who happens to be in that area at that time. Uh, now whether Oswald was actually a patsy or whether he actually pulled the trigger is another subject, another issue. Uh, but among people that deal with this subject, uh, that list of likely suspects uh, came to be known as the Oswald list. So my friends and I must have been on it, and they thought, hey, here's a chance to take out someone we don't want running for high political office, the presidency in this case. Uh, we'll have our professional shoot Wallace and blame it on these three dudes. But something must have happened at the last minute, and uh, they arrested us for assassinating George Wallace, except, uh, and this went out over the mass media. We've apprehended the three, we've apprehended and disarmed, federal agents have apprehended and disarmed the three assassins, and they're in federal custody at this point. The only problem was uh, the real shooter apparently missed, couldn't get a shot off chickened out, whatever. The real shooter didn't didn't shoot Wallace. Nobody shot him at all. No harm came to him at all. There was no attempt, no nothing. And yet they announced that uh, he'd been killed and that they'd arrested the three assassins. I was one of the three people they arrested. Pretty scary situation because if you think about it, once they realized the nature of the snafu that they'd made, the easiest and probably most rational course of action for the powers that be would be to bump the three of us off, or turn us back over to the lynch mob and let us get lynched, rather than having three loose cannons around for the next who knows how many years, decades, for the rest of our lifetime, knowing that the Oswald list is real and that uh, 
we were on it, but we almost got, uh, well, we did get arrested for assassinating George Wallace. The problem is, he didn't get assassinated at that point. They didn't get him until several weeks later. In the meantime, they let us go because, hey, you know, pretty hard to charge somebody with murder when, when the person they've allegedly murdered is alive and well and still on the campaign trail. So after a whole lot of horrific, freaky, scary hours in federal custody as they decided what to do with us, no doubt conferring with very high level higher ups in DC and the Vatican and who knows where, London. They decided that when all was said and done, they might as well just let us go and see what happens next. Well, <clears throat> I didn't make a point out of publicizing this uh, back then. Why bother? It seemed like a good way to get yourself disappeared, uh, a real good way. Not that I didn't tell anybody. No, no, I told my friends and girlfriends and people I worked for, pretty well anyone that was interested. It wasn't like I'm going to keep secrets for somebody. But I didn't write any books about it or go on the talk shows or make a fuss. But then I don't make any fuss about any number of things that I might well have fussed about almost getting lynched for an assassination that I didn't commit, didn't do, is just one of a, a long, long, long list of things about, about on that level, some a little worse, some maybe not quite so flamboyant, but all of them pretty interesting, and every single one of them, uh, in its own right, would be a pretty uh, sort of pretty big deal for anyone to live through and I've lived through hundreds of them. Yeah. One person in one lifetime has, for whatever reason, seen it all. That's right. I know who did. I know who did the dirty deeds and why. I know where all the skeletons are buried. Yep, I've known them for a long, long, long time. However, I had other interests than being a. Uh, a journalist, a writer, a muckraker, an exposer of political shenanigans wasn't where I was at in life, so I sort of just collected these experiences as I went through life, thought about them a lot, learned a lot from them, met a lot of interesting people, done a lot of interesting things, been a lot of interesting places. Know a lot more about how the world works than anybody. Yeah. Had an older brother, John, been dead six or seven years now, but he made movies and books and videos and cassettes and wrote plays and put on stage street theater and disrupted meetings and forced himself into the limelight his whole life. He too felt that he'd been, was privy to any number of interesting politically significant events. And I dare say he was. And uh, he, he spent his life uh, trying to publicize his view of things, his life, what had happened to him, why he felt it. It had all happened to him. And as I say, he wrote books, uh, made movies, did all sorts of things. He had to publish them himself because everything he said was just so politically incorrect and politically dangerous and such hot potatoes that no publisher, even the most avant-garde, even the most, well, the most fearless wouldn't begin to deal with any of the things John had to say. And the things that John had to say pale in comparison to what I have to say. That's the trouble with my book, getting it published. In fact, no one's ever read a page of it. I haven't even read a page of it. I type, and when I get to the bottom of the page, I pull it out of my typewriter and turn it over and start on the flip side. 
when I get to the bottom of the B side, I pull it out and put it in my ever-growing ream of pages completed and move on to the next page. That was 6,000 pages ago and I've never looked back. Never read a single word of what I've written. And no one else has either. Uh, whoever read it would flip out big time and probably decide that they should kill me right then and there and that well they'd know they wouldn't go to prison for it. In fact whoever killed me would probably be elected king of the world, king of the galaxy, emperor, El Presidente, uh, de Fuhrer. Anybody that killed me would be the, the greatest hero in the history of the human race. That is, once the world read my books, they'd say, yeah. And as I say, anyone reading it, I, I won't say anyone, but 99 plus percent of the people reading it, even if they were the most mild-mannered, non-violent, pacifistic souls imaginable, they would obtain a weapon, or if no weapon, just come to my door and start slugging and kicking. And because the things I say are that, inflammatory. They're true. They're true things, of course. It's only true things that could possibly be that inflammatory. So what sort of things are? What are these true inflammatory things? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I spent 6,000 pages to try to describe them and I failed for the most part. It would take far many, far more pages than that far more pages. In fact, just to describe a single day in my life would take 6,000 pages. Yeah. So, so now you want to know in a couple of paragraphs what it's all about. Okay. The name of my book is A Darker Shade of Black, subtitled The Plutonium Harvest. Subtitled The Highwayman's Story. Well, the first of those three uh, and the last are poetic. The middle one, the Plutonium Harvest subtitle, is the key to what the book is all about. Yes, <clears throat> Space Boys from wherever their advanced scout ships seeking out planets with uranium in the soil and a climate and environment that would allow that uranium to be mined by either living beings or robots, machines, androids, whatever, cyborgs. Uh, they found Earth, which is a planet that uh, has uranium in the soil, which can be made into plutonium. And, uh, of course, the what's the cheapest general purpose robot you can, you can have? A brainwashed, enslaved human being. They're versatile, they're self-reproducing, they can be taught to grow their own food, look after themselves, and mine the uranium and make the plutonium to boot. Yes, for the space visitors to have built actual robots to do all the things that humans have done in the last 6,000 years would have been ridiculously expensive and inefficient. They could have. They're ultra high tech and they could have built robots that would have mined the uranium and built the reactors and cooked it into plutonium. They could have done all that, but it was far simpler, far more economical, far more practical, far more reliable, more better to uh, uh, use recombinant DNA engineering in a high-tech bio lab to build human beings. <clears throat> That's why we never find the missing link between the great apes and humans. <clears throat> there is no missing link because on this planet the great apes have not yet evolved into humans. Now, given another zillion generations, the great apes probably would get smarter and smarter and I believe more and more human-like. However, on planet Earth, the great apes have only evolved to the great apes, the chimpanzees and the uh, gorillas, etc. Uh, we humans, 
we were built by the space visitors to <coughs> mine uranium and make it into plutonium. So when the mothership or the main fleet or whatever you want to call it arrives several thousand years after they, the scout ships that arrived here first built the human race and got us mining plutonium, uh, when the main fleet arrives the plutonium will be ready for the harvest. And of course they use plutonium uh, the same way we use it to, to uh, uh, as fuel for a nuclear reactor uh, fired electric generating station. You know, a nuke plant, just like we do on Earth. They, they use the heat generated by uh, the fission of plutonium to boil water into steam, and the steam turns, tur turns turbines, which turn dynamos that generate electricity. So, uh, that's what they use on their spacecraft, the same as we generate electricity here on Earth. No difference whatsoever. Well, Al, what about dilithium crystals and antimatter converters? And, well, there's no such thing as dilithium crystals and antimatter converters aren't real either. Uh, but that's, uh, that's uh, neither here nor there because a plutonium-fired nuclear electric plant is plenty efficient, plenty reliable, got all the good features you might want. Uh, plutonium has a half-life of 26,000 years, so you can go on a pretty long space flight and uh, use plutonium to supply your energy needs. It's not like plutonium is some second-rate fuel, not at all. Uh, and the laws of physics tell us that uh, it's not very likely there'll ever be anything uh, uh, more better than plutonium. It's, it's the most efficient energy source there is, or ever will be. At least uh, my understanding of physics leads me to believe that, and I think most other competent physicists uh, believe the same. Uh, and let me stress once again that uh, <laughs> It's not like plutonium some sort of second rate, or, well, we'll use that till we get something better, or, well, it'll do in a pinch. No, no, not at all. A plutonium-fired nuke plant is way efficient. Uh, got everything going for it you might want. So, the Space Boys came here, let's say, 6,000 years ago, who knows, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, and built the human race and have been manipulating human culture since that time made the world wars uh, to speed up technological progress. They generate a world war, let's say, because they know when the main fleet, that is the scout fleet that's been here for 10,000 years or so, they know approximately when the main fleet will get here. So they know about when they want to have the plutonium ready for harvesting. And that's the point we're at right about now, folks. Uh, I don't mean right this instant, uh, although it could be this instant, but I'm saying within the very near foreseeable future, uh, you know, any day, any week, any month, any year, uh, the main fleet will be here and uh, harvest the plutonium. And then they'll probably get rid of the humans they built because they, being ecologically oriented, as most advanced cultures would be. You know. uh, they're probably signatory to some galactic-wide green movement that says, hey, when you go and rape a planet uh, for its natural resources, plutonium for instance, uh, after you're done raping and harvesting, we kindly return the planet to the pristine condition that you found it in. Well, when they found it, found Earth, it didn't have any humans. So when they leave, after getting the plutonium, they'll probably leave it free of humans also. That is, they'll uh, turn loose uh, a high-tech virus and kill off the human population. Or, this is a pretty nice planet, they may colonize. They may kill off the human population and move in, move in where we were. Or conceivably keep us as slaves to keep mining the uranium and generating electricity for them. I think it's most likely that they'll colonize Earth, keep us as slaves, and then a portion of them will move on to whatever comes next, to whatever planet they 
find orbiting the next sun, the next star they arrive at. In other words, they'll leave, the scout ships will leave, and they'll head for the next star of interest. The scout, ship, scout ships will fan out ahead of them, uh, hoping to find planets that have mineable uranium in an environment uh, that allows that mining to happen. If it's too cold, living forms don't function well, robots don't function well in super cold conditions, the greases are thick enough and nothing works. If it's too hot, the plastic melts, the transistors don't work, uh, the grease thins out and leaks out of the bearings. Uh, so if it's too cold or too hot, mining uranium gets to be a real drag. You want a nice medium temperature, like Earth, where water exists in its three phases, uh, uh, ice, water, and steam, solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, planet Earth isn't just a planet that allows life to exist, it's the ideal planet for life to exist on. It has the ideal amount of gravity, it has the ideal tilt in relation to, the, to its orbit around the Sun, tilt to the ecliptic. Uh, it has the ideal temperature range, it's the ideal size, etc. It has the ideal atmosphere. Of course, all those things are connected. If it was much, much bigger, let's say, it wouldn't have the ideal atmosphere because the gravity would be wrong. If it was much smaller, it would have far less gravity, and like the moon, wouldn't have any atmosphere. So Earth just happens to be the right size, the right density, made of the right materials, the right distance from the sun. Uh, the right shape orbit, the right this, the right that. It has the moon to give us tides so that we've got shellfish and crustaceans that we can eat. Must be getting hungry for a shrimp dinner. Well, boy, I've sort of jumped way ahead of myself here. I was just going to test out this new camera and see if it works. And here I'm blabbing about the plutonium harvests and mile a minute and uh, for all I know this thing isn't even taping so what I'm going to do is stick my medicine back under my tongue brush my hair a minute here and uh, take a hiatus here an intermission a break and take that tape right out of that machine and see if it actually taped me. Oh. <clears throat> if it has, I'll be back and we'll continue where we left off. That is, we'll, I'll tell you more. And if not, well, you'll never be seeing or hearing this, and I'll try again, starting from the beginning. But for now, let's see what we got here, folks. <laughs>